My Faith Radio now presents the Sunday morning service at Restoration Church with Pastor Greg Lilly. Let's join the service already in progress. Okay, we're going to start um, a little mini series inside of a, inside of a series. And um, we've been talking about as it is in heaven, the prayer that Jesus had us pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But we're also going to continue that emphasis, but emphasize another little revelation, mini-series I call it. And we're looking at the Joshua generation. And you say, well, what is, what is that? That's what we're going to look at. Remember last week we talked about how the kingdom of God out of um, Micah, chapter 2, where it breaks forth. And the picture was the shepherd coming out in the first of the day, leading the sheep out because he had blocked him, blocked the sheep in overnight from the wolves and you know predators and things of that nature. And then in the morning, if you were on the outside, you'd see all of a sudden these blocks and bricks and stones, whatever, come busting out and the shepherd leading the sheep. That's God advancing his rule and reign on earth through us. Once we get saved and the kingdom of God comes within us, then we break out into this earth to do the will of God. That's the prayer. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we're going to look at the characteristics of the Joshua generation because they are coming out of Egypt. They went through the wilderness. It's the second generation, and they're going to break out into the land of Canaan. And they're not there just to play games. They're not there just to look around. They're there with a mission. They're there with a purpose, a mandate from God. So we're going to look at the characteristics of the Joshua generation. That's Joshua leading a generation into the land of Canaan as the Holy Spirit, Christ, in us, leads us into our promised land to do that very thing we're called and raised for. And I think we can learn a lot from this generation. So we're going to look at it in the next couple weeks or so. So what's the Joshua generation? It's a generation of people called, chosen for a specific time and purpose. To receive an inheritance by conquering. To receive an inheritance by conquering. Okay? Ephesians and Joshua. Those two books. Ephesians and Joshua. Are to be looked at and read together. You say, well, how, how come? Why is that? Why do we take a book out of the old and we read it in the book of the new? Because Ephesians is a book that reveals or unveils to us the riches that are in Christ Jesus. Okay? Well, what's Joshua going to go into the land to do? They're going to conquer it because in that land is their inheritance. Well, why do they got to conquer it? Why can't they just go in there and get it? See, that, see, this is why you have to understand. They can't just go in there and get what God gave them because there's an enemy in that land that says, no, I don't think so. It's my, it's my, number one, it's, it thinks it's its land. And everything in it, they think it's theirs. So here comes a whole generation of people into a, a land, and God's going to transfer the wealth of that wicked people into the hands of the righteous. So the devil got all this in the Garden of Eden, did he not? Hmm? And for 4,000 years he set up his principalities and powers, and he got the gold, he got the silver, he got that. And anybody he can get, he can get um, to, to do his bidding that's unsaved, he rewards those sinners with the wealth. And you don't think he does that? Is that not what he went to Jesus to do? He said, if you bow down and do my bidding, all this is what? Yours. So if the enemy can get people in high places to do wicked things, he rewards his people. He has... He pays them pretty well. Right? So the enemy's got the land. So you get saved. You get born again. God puts his, his, his kingdom in you and then says, here's your inheritance. Now, it's not something you can go over there and see. It's a spiritual inheritance. you got to see what it is in heaven. 
and then you've got to, the enemy's going to fight you because he's not going to let it happen on earth. He don't care whether it's already happened in heaven because Satan's not in heaven. His domain is the prince of the power of the air is here. And so you've got to now see, wait a minute. So when I see what's going on in heaven, and I want to now do it here on earth, he's, he's going to oppose me. So that's why there's a conquering that has to be done. And we call this, this company of people a spirit of conquering. They've got to go into that land and take what God gave them. If there was no devil, you would automatically get it by just seeing it and just speaking it, walking in it. You get it. But now you've got forces that are up against you. See, why can't you ever get your marriage where you want it to be? Why can't you get the finances where you want it to be? Why can't the family and everybody in it just be unified? Why can't they not just be unified? Because there's powers, there's things that are working against us. Spirits in heavenly places working against us to rob us of what is ours. To, lead, to, to lie to us. To deceive us out of what is ours. It's all the enemy trying to keep us from manifesting heaven on earth and experiencing it. Does that make sense? So when you look at the book of Ephesians, you're going to say, that's mine. Well, it's funny that the first couple chapters he tells you what's yours, and then at the end he tells you about spiritual warfare. That's just in one book. Chapters 1 and 2 is about the riches, chapter 3 about the riches, and then you get to chapter 6, it's about the spiritual warfare that you're going to have to go up against to get those riches, to receive those in the inheritance, because it just doesn't come by osmosis. So then you take the book of Ephesians, you see the riches, then you look at the book of Joshua and see how it is a battle of conquering, walking in faith to receive it. So those two books go together. All right. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how they all, that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Now, this is Paul talking about something that Israel went through in the Old Testament that you need to know today. So he goes to the next verse. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. We talked about that Thursday night. But when many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after the things they lusted after. Then we'll jump to 11. Now all these things happened. Now you can see all that stuff that happened to them. Now Paul's saying, now all these things happened unto them for examples. And they are written for our examples admonition upon whom the ends of the world would co are to come. So Paul's saying that when we read these Bible stories, they're just not stories that we teach kids in Sunday school, all oh, that's cute and, you know, memorize stories and things. If that's all that is, it stops there at memorization. Or are you reading it tonight at home and going, oh, okay. No, you're supposed to get some truth out of that. Some example out of that that helps you live today in your current situation and circumstance. That's why you want to read the Old Testament, not to look at or, or not to look at laws that to the year to live by. That's what that's he wrote that on your heart. We're looking at the Old Testament now and looking at those stories for types, shadows that point to Jesus, showing me what he is and how I am to go about this spiritual walk. These are examples for us today. They weren't written for them. It's like if you did an autobiography. Who are you writing it for? You? <laughs> you already, why are you writing it for you? You already know everything that happened in your life. Why are you writing an autobiography? For, the, for other people to benefit from, not you. And this Bible was written so that we could benefit from it. And Paul's telling us that. 
So we're going to look at these characteristics of Joshua, this generation, and pull from it how we're to live and operate today. All right? So whether you believe this or not, we're living in the most exciting times of the church on earth right now. We can't go back and go, oh, you know, Luther in the Reformation, as great as that was, Luther in the Reformation, that's not helping me today. In fact, if Luther was alive today, if Luther was alive today, would he be as powerful and productive as he was in the 16th century? The answer would probably be no, simply because he's not raised for this time. So he would not be able to do the things that you're called to do because Luther was raised for such a time as that. And in his world, his generation, that was the most exciting time of the church called Reformation. But can you go back and live from that? See, you're going to see a lot of characteristics between Moses and Joshua. Here's one. What we're going to talk about next week, I'll throw it at you. They carried Joseph Bones out of Egypt, right, into the wilderness. They carried Joseph's bones out of Egypt. Well, we, what's God calling us to carry? Joshua carries the ark into the land of Canaan. They're not going to carry dead bones. That first generation carried dead bones, traditions, old theology, stuff that doesn't work for them. Joseph couldn't work for them. He's dead. He's bones. But they're going to take him and carry him out. Joshua's not going to take bones. He's going to take the Ark of the Covenant. He's going to take the glory of God into the next phase. So where we're at today, I can't take and rely on Luther and everything. What is God saying now? We're not going to throw Joseph's bones completely away because that's history. But I'm not going to... i got to hear what God's doing now, not read what He did in the 16th century. I can learn from it, but i got to hear what God's doing now. Does that make sense? What are we going to carry into this generation? This today, the church today, does not see itself in the most exciting times of this generation. You're not responsible for the past generation. You're not there. You can't worry about the generation to come because you won't be living in that generation. All you can do now is say, Lord, I am responsible to take the glory of God into this generation and see what's happening today in context of what you're doing in heaven so we can manifest on earth. So as far as you, you are concerned, this has to be for such a time as this that you were raised. You've got to see yourself. I'm not here taking up space, time, and air. I'm here on purpose. I'm here with a mandate and a mission in my life to do what I'm seeing in heaven. Are we going to go home and go do our eight hour a day job and just be done with that and come home and watch TV? Go ahead. You ain't going to have any rewards and any fulfillment in heaven on earth. There are so many people that are in bondage to stuff, medicating their pain because they're trying this, that. There is no answer when you're living earth, on earth with earth. No answer. It's, it's going to be complete. God will let you get to rock bottom to show you the, the earth is offering us nothing. Okay, If you're putting all your eggs in this basket, you're going to be sadly disappointed and mistaken. You've got to put heaven in what's happening on earth. And there's where your contentment comes, your fulfillment, your joy, everything, because you're connected to heaven and on earth and doing something called God here, manifesting Him. So this has to be, and we, has to, we have to see this, not as what we've been through. Now, there is a reason why we're doing this series. Because we, to, to, to be honest, you can look at 2020 as the worst year you probably know of, the, everything that's happened. And that ain't the blessing of God. And how the governments come along and, and really show their true callers and how they feel about church and God, that's been exposed. Now you can look at that and be discouraged and depressed, or you can look at that and say, wait a minute, we're raised for such a time as this. I'm not going to let this, this depress me. 
So you go to the book of Esther, and you see that Haman plotted against the Jews to exterminate a whole people. That's not good times, is it? Haman's high up. He's not some low guy down here no one knows of. This guy has got money. He's got clout. He's got position. He's got ties. And he can, he can, sway, he, he can sway the king. So you've got a media right now that's trying to sway everybody. You've got everybody against you, the church, trying to sway the church. Keep the church in lockdown. Keep the church quiet. Keep the church not doing this. Keep the church not doing that. This, this, folks, was, do with this what you want, this was an experiment to see in the future what can be done, how more they can get away with. Or they pushed this this far and no one said anything, and then it'll get back to normal to a degree, but they've already pushed you. You'll never get back to where you were, and they're there to push you another degree. So you can see and understand this however you want, but you have to understand that we're living in a, in a warfare of spirit versus the physical, Satan versus God, his kingdom against God's kingdom, and we are in this warfare. We talked about spiritual warfare how long on Thursday nights. Okay? So you have to understand what, what's happening here. So Esther is the only one with Mordecai who goes to Esther and says, do you know what Haman's doing? You need to get to the king. She won't go because you just can't appear to the king. She's in his his um, bridal thing or whatever you call that, and but you just got you got to be summoned by the king. You just don't show up without an invitation because people have died doing that because it's respect for the king. So she has. So he says to her, "If you don't, God will raise somebody else up to do it." And then he says, "For who knows? God has raised you up. What? For such a time as this." So Esther, you're gonna let it, you're gonna let fear, you're gonna let what Haman wants to do keep you locked down and not go to the king, not step out in faith, but stay locked down, fear and trembling, because you don't understand, Esther. You're the key. You're the key. And when you understand this, you understand you were raised for such a time as this. And the church of Jesus Christ in this generation, as any other generation and the ones to come, you people right here are raised to go through a 2020. And we missed it. We didn't see it coming, and then when it came, we didn't know what to do. Now I'm saying we in general. Am I... Are, what, what did we do? We were taking our cues from the world. We were taking our cues from the world. So hopefully what the church is going to learn, this is why we're doing this series, we have to, we have to be a Joshua generation because it's a conquering people who goes out to conquer, to destroy the works of the devil, principalities and powers, because we're not wrestling flesh and blood. These principalities and powers came against the church, came against the world, and the church was nowhere to be found to do anything but cower in fear. We can't do this again. If we don't learn, well, why do you keep, this 2020 is almost over. Greg, as soon as the election's done, it's going to go back to normal. That's not the point. I can't promise you that, but that is not the point. The point is, are we going to be ready? Are we going to learn from this because you think the enemy's done? He may, he may not have a chance for another five years, but he's going to come back again. In fact, when he went to Jesus three times with temptations, after the third time, do you think he just went home and said, well, it's not working? It says in the Greek, when he backed off, the Greek has it that he backed off like a boxer would his opponent, only to back off to look for another time to hit him. So we might have a two-year reprieve, and then here comes the enemy again. What did we learn in 2020 to be prepared for 2025? We're still part of this generation. You've got a 40-year generation. He's going to work on you to keep you from conquering and manifesting heaven on earth. What are we learning from stuff like this? And if the church just keeps playing the games it's playing, we're not learning nothing. And then when 2025 comes along, and this time it's more than a lockdown, what are we going to do? Uh, maybe you don't want to do it. Maybe, maybe. See, this is where Jesus said, count the cost. You understand what you're involved in. 
And there are going to be a lot of people like, I didn't sign up for this. I'm not doing this. And that's fine. No condemnation. Just go home and lose all your rewards and your mandate down here. Because you, you, you can't, if you can't count the cost and reach forward to what lies ahead, I don't know what to tell you. Because that's witness means martyr. Be my witness. Witness means martyr. Whether it's a literal martyrdom or you giving up your life down here and gaining it on the other end. I don't know, but you got to figure that if the, if you, what you want out of life. If, if, I mean, again, how many times have we talk about this? There, were, there are people that come down here with a mandate and the enemy gets them over here into a career. The enemy gets them into a relationship. I'm so sick of seeing people loving God and then somebody comes along and now, uh, now they're back to square one because they let a person draw them away. Rather than them draw that person closer to God, they're letting that person draw them away. So we get caught up in relationships. We get caught up, caught up in, 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 in jobs. We get caught up in our hobbies. Go ahead. That, that, you come down here and then you go ahead and you engage that you go ahead and, and say, well, you know, I'll go do this. And God's like, that's not what you were raised for. So you forfeit that down here. Paul calls that in 1 Corinthians 9 being a castaway. So when you get to heaven, you're going, you'll go to heaven because you're not there by your works. You're there by faith. When you get to heaven, there's nothing there. You didn't do nothing for him on this end. And that's why he gets, that's why he's got parables. Where he says, I gave a guy one parable, I gave one guy five par one talent, five talents, ten talents. And the one guy didn't do anything with what he was raised for. Think of a talent as your anointing. Think of the talent as your call of God. What you're ordained to do. Jeremiah, I knew you before your mother's womb and I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. Now he can run from that. Or he can be that. Nehemiah runs from his calling. Or not Nehemiah. What's the guy? Jonah. Runs from his calling. And God's like, nah, I'm not going to let you get away with this. And you get the fish story. Fish puts him back out. And he has to go do what he... And you got Elijah, the prophet, who's after his big Mount Carmel success against Jezebel and the false prophets... He goes, and he's under a juniper tree, and starts getting into depression, and wants to give up. You know what God does? He wants to give up his mandate. What's, what's God do? Anybody remember that? See, these are stories for us today. What's he do? Jo Jonah, he's not going to let him get away with it. But Elijah, okay, you want to, okay. And he raises up another prophet. And prophet Elisha gets the double anointing of Elijah, and then God takes Elijah home. So, what are we going to, we're going to forfeit why we're here now? Let's take it to this level, all right? As a church, the body of Christ. Now, let's look at it as a local church. We're here. You're not here on accident. I don't know why you're here. I, I'm hoping you're here because the Spirit of the Lord led you here. And if that's the case, great. Because now we're all here locally together with also a mission and a mandate. Huh? We're not here but to, to, to be pew sitters or just to be entertained or whatever. We're here to hear what God is doing and step out in it here. This is the place here. Right here is a place where you may not have the presence of God in your home for whatever reason. But here it ought to, it ought to be here, wouldn't it? Shouldn't it? How about, well, I, in my house or at my job while I'm out there, I can't get anybody to lay hands on me and heal me. Okay, well, should this not be the place for that? Number one, this should be like a, an, uh, a zone where the enemy doesn't even want to come, where God's glory just drips. I mean, if any play, I mean, I go out in the world and I have to, I, I, not I have to, but I watch TV and I hear things and I hear other people, I see social media, and I'm like, oh, this ought to be a refuge for people. Not come here and get more of out there. Huh? 
So are we cultivating a place, an atmosphere here, using our gifts, using our anointings, coming together for when people, when God brings people here, are they going to find the glory of God, heaven on earth, or just more of out there where they've been all week long? More of that in here. Well, how do we get there? That means every single one of you have to carry your ark into this place when we come together. You come here saying, Lord, what, what are you doing here today and what can I do to help usher in just today in this little time frame, this hour, that we can do something to destroy Because every one of you have got works of the devil that you still have working and operating in your life even when you got saved because you haven't been delivered from them yet. There's still remnant of the devil's works in your life. And how, much, how about the works he tried to put on you all week long? Well, this should be the place where you can come and we can deliver you from that. This would be a place where you, you can come and, and get complete deliverance from past stuff, deliverance from present stuff, and get renewed and strengthened to go out there brighter than when you came in. And if we're not doing that here, what are we doing? Because the Joshua generation is going to show up and manifest some stuff. The glory of God is going to be manifested. And, and the devil's and the enemy is going to be plundered. His goods are going to be when Joshua and that generation shows up, things are never going to be the same. And that's what we need to be characteristic characteristic of. All right. So the first generation did not get to do this because of unbelief. So I'm going to ask myself this question. I got to personalize this as well as you do, because. We're going to go somewhere with this here. I only got a few minutes, but check this out. So now I'm talking about this in the church. Remember I said, well, maybe you can't get the presence of God at home, but my goodness, you ought to be able to walk into it here. Okay, let's go back to you now. This We go from the body of Christ in general to the local church here, and now what about you as an individual? Why aren't you getting the presence of God in your home? What is that off limits? Just here? I, I can only have church here? I can't have church at home? Sometime in the future, we're going to talk about the home. I am not the one to talk about it. But he won't let me. He won't let this leave me. And he, and he gave me a word this week. I'm praying this morning, not this morning, but this week, one morning this week. And I hear the word in my spirit, beachhead. I'm like, well, I know that's some military term, but I don't know exactly. I, 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 let me get the definition. So I get, I look it up, and I'm not going to get it completely right, but um, cause I don't have my notes here to, to tell you what I, what I read. But you look it up yourself. And it's a place where, like, say, a military is going to go into a foreign land, and they set up a place on the beach. And then from that place, they launch purpose, plan, destiny, whatever, their attack. Okay. We'll talk about that because the beachhead is your home. Why? Because they can get your kids in school. Hmm? Can they? Can, can they get to your kids in school? Oh, they're now telling you that you got to sign stuff that you don't get to listen to what's happening through media if they're going to stay home this year. You got some places are having you sign that you won't watch. Excuse me? That's that to me would be a whole hell no. That ain't working. I'm going to tell you right now, you do what you want. That don't work for me. That ain't working. That will never work. And if we don't stand up for that, I'm not allowed to know what my te the teachers are teaching my kids. Why do I say the family's the beachhead? Because that is the only place left. What about church? Well, you can see what they're chipping away here. There ain't no church in communist China. But there is what? Family, house, family. That's that's the fight. You get the family, it's over with. And we got to get back to the family. And the, and the man in that family being the damn high priest, he ought to be over his family. This ab absentee fatherhood, absentee priest, not taking responsibility. That stuff's got to stop because that is why the black community is in the shape that it's in. Fatherless kids. Destroy the family. Destroy the family. That's what MLB want, or Black Lives Matter is about destroying the nuclear family. It's the beachhead. 
That's where you and your family come together and that's where God works out of. Then we come together, these families come together as a church here and really amplify this thing called the church. Families, the church are made up of what? Families. If the families are all screwed up, then ultimately it's going to affect the church because you are the church. So we got to take this thing, clear back to the family and get our houses in order. Because that's where, that's, that's where it begins. That's where the attack is. That's where the enemy's attack is. But that's where it begins with you and God and your family. I don't know. Do that with whatever you want. But that's... We're going to be a people that either don't flow in this of what God's doing in our generation. And like, what did we learn? The first generation didn't get it done. And they went back into the wilderness and wasted away. Now, you can look at your life... And I'm going to tell you right now, if you're not in the land of Canaan spiritually and you're doing God's will and things are happening and, the, and you and God are making things happen or you're just sitting around doing nothing, you are in the wilderness wasting away and you don't know it. How many Christians day after day after day sit in front of that TV, day after day go visit family, go get something to eat, come back, do it again. My God, that, that's what you're rate. Jesus died for that? I read something somebody put on Facebook. Sometimes you get some good stuff on there. It says, look what you're doing and ask yourself, did Jesus die for that? Look at your life, how it is, and say, so Jesus died on the cross so I can have Netflix and binge on it. Of course that sounds ludicrous, doesn't it? Jesus died so I could have Netflix. And yet, if we're not doing anything for Jesus, but boy, are we connected to Netflix, that's exactly what you're saying. And you would never say that, but your life exemplifies that. That's not a Joshua generation. That's, a, that's the first generation who's in the wilderness, going to work, watching TV, having their hobbies, doing nothing, wasting away, a generation wasted away and died in the wilderness to make way for the next generation to come. Well, I just thought God got me saved so I can have a good life. Really? Or did He die to become your life? So you do what He tells you to do. Want what He wants you to have. And the next generation, Joshua is going to enter in and conquer it by faith, not unbelief. That's why the just shall live by faith. This thing... This conquering is all faith. It's all faith. We'll get into that. By the way, on the radio, um, start. we've got about three of them up there now, but we're going to be doing some more on faith. I'm telling you, you got to watch this stuff on faith. It's not what you're hearing. It, it is really encouraging stuff that we're doing on the radio on faith, but just to let you see that. Anyway, so the early church has, the, each church, this one, and a family, church family, church is made of family, has a commission to fulfill. And are we fulfilling it because the Joshua generation is going to fulfill their mandate. So that's I'm going to be all over the place. Joshua 1 1. And I gotta get I, I'm I'm just out of time. We're gonna to have to finish this outline next week. But let's go with Joshua 1 1. I want to get this in. We've got about 10, 10, 10 12 minutes left. Now watch this. Joshua 1 1 what is the first word to this generation? That's key. They're out the gate. They've not been in the land yet. The first word is now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke unto Joshua. This is the first word, and this is what he said. Next. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise. So the now word is is arise. Now that's what Isaiah will come and tell the, the New Testament church. Though darkness covers the earth and deep darkness, but what? Arise, because the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. That's the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is representative of Jesus. Every little piece in that Ark represents Jesus and the presence of Jesus, the power, the anointing. And you have that in you. Now arise and go in there in the power of the Spirit. You have the glory, the ark of God, and we are to go in. So the word is, now 
therefore arise. Go over this Jordan. Now we'll get into that now in the Jordan here next week. But I want you to see the now arise. Now arise. Now, how is Joshua going to go in there and conquer that land? He's got the word, okay, you're 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 up against the Jordan, get ready to cross it, go forward, go into that. That is their beginning mandate. Arise. Now, isn't it amazing when God's telling us, the church, to arise, the world told us to sit down. Hmm? Did it not? God's going to tell Joshua to speak. But the world told us to put a mask on and stay quiet. You don't see the correlation? Mind you, you think I'm just making this stuff up. Hmm? This is all symbolism. There's something more going on behind social distancing and masks. It's all you can see is masks and social distancing and staying home. If that's how you see it, and you don't see really the roots behind of what they all represent and what it really truly can get to and mean, then it doesn't mean nothing to you. You think I'm just a quack up here. Okay? How is Joshua going to conquer? Now go to Exodus 17, verse 14. We looked at this Thursday night. And the Lord said unto Moses, because remember, Joshua is being mentored by Moses, discipled by Moses. And the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book. So he's got a book. I don't know what's in that book, but there's a book and he wrote stuff in there, right? You, you follow that so far? In that book. And rehearse it. Now how are you going to rehearse something? In the ears of Joshua. That means Moses has to do what for Joshua to hear what's in that book? Speak it. Well, why not just give Joshua the book? If I say to Stevie, hey, I got a book you you know I want you to look at. All right. So I, 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 he said, no, I, I can't. I'm, I'm going to read it to you. What? I'm going to read it to you. I want you to read this book, but I'm going to read it to you. He says, I, that's okay, but I can read it myself. No, that's not how it works. I got to read it to you. He probably won't want to read the book then if I, if I come with the book. Right? Well, it's the same thing. Moses says, you got to read this book. All right, no, no, no. I'm going to read it for you. Like a little kid. Nighttime stories. I'm going to read you the book. And this went on every day. I don't know how long, but it says right there, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out of the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, which is destroying the work of the devil. So Moses, or Moses is going to have to speak in the hearing of Joshua. Joshua's faith has to be up to par to destroy the works of the devil when he is up to bat. Now we just showed you, it says Moses is what? Dead. Okay, Joshua, you're up. And he's ready because of, because of his faith is ready because of the hearing of Moses speaking that Word of God out of a book. Now, where do we find the Word of God and the book together? What is that called? Wow, that's interesting. So we already have a book. And it's already got words in it. Now, is that not what we are to do for faith? To be ready? To go forward? To conquer? We have to have faith, right? Huh? You guys follow me? Go to the, ne go to the next verse i got. Yeah. So then, Paul sees this. He says, I... See, Paul's going to the Old Testament and says, Hey, I can use that. That's for me for today. And he sees that and says, Faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by the Word of God. So Moses has a book with the Word of God in it. He has to speak it to Joshua to get his faith to come. So when it's time for him to step up the bet to the plate, he can now conquer. You can't conquer without faith. One characteristic of the Joshua generation is they are people of faith. Next week we'll look at the, the people of God's presence. They love the presence of God. We're going to look at all the characteristics I can find in the Joshua generation because that's got to be characteristic of who we are today. Is that where you see where we're going to go with this? 
Okay, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Next one. Same chapter, look at verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee. Where is it? Well, yeah, it's nigh me. It's in a book. No, it's even in your... So that word has to be in your mouth, which we talked about Thursday. As he says, the word of God is so near you, it's in your mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith, because the word produces faith, which he says we preach. All right, you got that? That makes sense? So that brings us into what do we do to be a conquering people? We are people of word, and we are people who speak that word. I remember in, um, I, would, I would say, early 90s, I was listening to this guy preaching, and he shared this story. This is my first, like, wow, okay. Um, I'd heard of positive confession and stuff that the faith teachers were, were, were using. And there's some truth to that, but they take it too far by whatever you say you can have. That's not true. You can only say what you're raised for. You can only have what's in your inheritance. Do, do we know that? Do I got to go re repeat that for the millionth time? Okay. You can't have what you say. You can't write your own ticket. Unless, you can't call those things or not anywhere unless you hear it and see it in heaven or in that word. All right, so here we go. This guy was talking about how he he and one of he's the pastor of his church, got a big church, and one of his guys is a businessman. He said, "Hey, I'm going to, I'm going on a trip. You want to go with me for a couple of days?" He goes, "Yeah, well, I'll go there. I've never been to that state. I'll go there." So he's they're there, and um, he says, "Except in the morning, I get up and pray." Is that okay? We get up and pray in the morning about five o'clock, and the pastor says, "Well, sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's my job. Pray, right?" So he gets up. And um, it's 5 o'clock in the morning. He said, man, I was tired. He said, this guy gets up. He gets in his briefcase. He pulls out some of these papers. And he just goes to town. And I'm over there on the other side of the, of the room, on my side of the bed. Two beds. <laughs> his side of the, not his side of his bed, but his bed. And um, all of a sudden he says, I'm just listening. I'm like, I've, I've never seen this before. And um, he is just... What, and what he's doing is... He is decreeing the Word of God. He's prophesying the Word of God. He's praying Scripture. He said, within a matter of minutes, he said, it taught me something big. He said, in a matter of minutes, it changed the atmosphere in that room. He said, I'm a pack. This guy's not a minister. I'm the minister. And he taught me how to charge an atmosphere with the glory of God. And how did he do it? Word of God in his mouth. Now, the, on those papers, in his briefcase, was the Word, Scriptures. And he's laying in bed at 4.30. What's the atmosphere of the room? Sure isn't charged with the glory of God, is it? So 4.30, he's in bed sleeping. Scriptures in his briefcase. Atmosphere just normal or average or whatever. Pastor wakes up 5 o'clock in the morning, same atmosphere it was at 4.30. He starts praying, same atmosphere. His prayers ain't changing nothing until this guy starts. Now, what happened? That word lays dormant. Ain't working for you, is it, in the briefcase? Huh? You follow? Is, is that word working in the briefcase? What's it got to do? Where's it got to go? In your mouth. You speaking that word activates that word and manifests the life of that word in your life, atmosphere, and everyone around you. Making sense? You don't believe that, do you? Well, okay. Jesus. He's in the desert. He gets there, and there's who waiting for him to tempt him. And what does Jesus respond? What, what's in Jesus' mouth in responding to the devil? How does Jesus talk back to the devil? With the word. Did it work? Now, had Jesus spoken everything but the word, the devil would have won. Hmm? So if you don't think, oh, I'm not doing that. I don't know. Well, Jesus did it. And I'll tell you how important it is what comes out of your mouth. Here's Zechariah, the high priest 
hears words from heaven. An angel shows up. And in the Old Testament, the angel, and the Gospels are still the Old Testament, an angel shows up. An angel is going to speak on behalf of heaven. So he's hearing Zechariah, the high priest, is hearing heaven through an angel. Where you and I get to hear the Holy Spirit, right? He had an angel. And we're also seated there to hear. But he's got an angel. And how does he respond to that angel? He's telling him that your wife Elizabeth who's barren, is going to have a son, and we're going to call his name John the Baptist, and he's going to do this, he's going to be a forerunner of Jesus, whatever. How does he respond to that? How does he respond to that? He Unbelief. He didn't believe it. So, you know, if you tell somebody something, and they go, I don't believe that. I don't care. You walk away. It doesn't, it doesn't it, it's, they ain't going to change what it already is, Right? What does the angel do? Come on, guys. you got to walk with me on this. What's the angel? How does the angel respond to the guy who can't line his words up with heaven? He shut him. He says, till John is born, you, sir, will be a mute. That's what he said. What? Because God needs people to speak his word to manifest his will and if he's got somebody in the house who's not lining his words up with God's intent purpose plan you got to get him out of the way Jesus is in that house wanting to heal that little girl what did he do he got everybody out of the house because they were laughing and mocking words words so we have to understand there's a lesson to be learned here. What and we talked about this Thursday night. You're going to, you're eating the fruit of your lips. You're eating the fruit of your lips. You are you are building a life based on what's coming out of your mouth. Negativity which the enemy uses and builds strongholds through your words. Or you're speaking and lining up with heaven and manifesting heaven on earth in your individual life, family, church, whatever. That makes sense? So that briefcase What's in that briefcase changed the atmosphere. If you don't have the word of, word of God in your mouth, you don't activate the word. And I'll give you another one here. Elijah. Do you, do you all know how he stopped the rain for three and a half years? Okay, so did he hear it from God? No, he didn't. Wait a minute. So, how is he going to stop it from raining for three and a half years when he never heard heaven say, it's not going to rain for three and a half years. I taught on this before. She might be getting a little bit of it if she remembers. But, how did that happen? Can he just stop rain whenever he wants to? But he looks like he did because we got no place where it says God said, Elijah, come here. I want you to tell them that it's not going to rain for three and a half years. He, we don't find that anywhere. So how in the world did it stop raining for three and a half years? Now, why did it stop raining for three and a half years? What was the climate? What was the landscape? What was the atmosphere of the day? Jezebel and her false prophets were ruining the land and persecuting God's people. And so God's like, I'm going to stop this. But God doesn't say anything. So you, what, what Elijah did is that he goes to the book of Deuteronomy because that's words written where? In a book. So he goes to the book where there's words of God and he's reading it one day and he says, if my people turn to foreign gods and start, wor and start, start worshiping these gods, and these gods were Jezebel's gods, false prophets, he said, I will shut the heavens. Now that word laid dormant in the book of Deuteronomy for God knows how long between Moses and Elijah. And that's got to be at least hundreds of years. And it wasn't until a man of faith, Elijah, reads that, grabs it, and goes to King Ahab and what? Speaks that. Now there, you can't get out of that. And what happened? Heaven came on earth and stopped the rain for three and a half years. What are you doing with your... That Bible is not there just to memorize Bible stories. 
Find out what God is doing. Find out what His will is for your life and speak it. You're all worried about obedience, but there's no faith to obey. That word brings faith. And when you speak it, boom, things start ha happening and manifesting. Now, a king, to give decrees, has to what? Speak. You have to speak what you're, what the, the king, the king has a will. He's the king of the domain. So he has a kingdom, king, domain, kingdom. And if he has a will, which he will have a will, and he has to implement that will called decree, what does he got to do? Speak it. And we are called kings and priests today. And as kings who reign in this life, what are we decreeing as kings? Can you imagine being a king, having a scepter, but not doing anything? That's called Congress. Huh? Worthless. And that's called church. We have been, what, what, what do you think the keys of the kingdom are? What's the keys of the kingdom? To do what? Bind. Bind and loose. That's the keys. He says, I've given you the keys to the kingdom. Bind and loose. Well, how do you bind something? You speak it. How do you loose something? You speak it. Where do you think these keys, these keys have got to be in your mouth? Binding and loosening is in your mouth. What you hear in heaven has to be spoken on earth. All right, so I'm going to close with this. I got the word beachhead. A minute or two later, I get another word called preemptive strikes. I'm like, I am not a military person. Why are you? T I don't know what all this stuff means. I have an idea by being around people or watching movies of what some of this stuff. So I look up preemptive strikes. And I read it and I'm like, now we'll look these definitions up later. We'll, we'll, we'll hit on this. I'm just giving you what I just got real quick this week. And I'm thinking preemptive strikes. So I look at that. I'm like, man, okay, God, you're, now I know he's saying something. Now, So you've got a beachhead. It could be your family. It could be the church. We're going to launch an attack from us being united together called church. And the gates of hell should not prevail against us. He's given us keys to bind and loose. He, we've got a mandate, which is heaven on earth. So now we're going to have to start launching preemptive attacks. Now, one aspect of that is we always wait for the devil to attack us before we get our sword and get this and get that armor on. And it's already too late. He's already got us like a spider in a web and boom, we succumb to the temptation or whatever he's trying to do in our life that day. What a preemptive strike will do is that there's no enemy around, so you go ahead and you get on the offense and you start attacking before he does. Does that make sense? So I don't know what you're... What you're let me tell you something. We've, we've, got to, we've got to get this because... And don't hear what I'm not saying. Your personal, your personal unbelief will produce personal sin. Um, whatever way, fashion, form the enemy attacks you in will be your downfall. He knows your weakness. I don't. He does. And if we just sit there and wait for the enemy to come and then try to do something back, he's already... If, if you were going to go up against somebody and you let them hit you twice, it, it, the, the comeback's going to be a little harder, isn't it? Step ahead. So, but if I hit him twice, I have a better chance of winning if I hit him first. Huh? What we do is we let the enemy hit, 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 give us an uppercut, hit us in the, in the, in the body, and now we're like, <laughs> where's that sword? <laughs> where's the, honey, pray for me. Call your, pray, pray for me. I just got hit by the, see? You already, you already got an eight ball. We're not on the offense. We're not doing any prevent. So to me, a preventive strike would be that if you get attacked early in the morning, and it's like after a while you realize where your weak moments are in times, or if you get attacked late at night. Some people can't go to sleep because when they're on their bed, and all of a sudden the enemy starts coming, and their mind goes 90 miles an hour, and they've just ruined a night's sleep. And it happens often. Or first thing you get up in the morning and the enemy attacks you. See, what's happening is 
you're in bed waiting for the enemy to attack you with those thoughts. You go to bed and you wait for the enemy. Hope, 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 I just don't have those thoughts today. Well, what you're saying is, I hope the enemy doesn't hit me today. How about if you know, and I'm not saying for everybody to do this, but if it's a common thing that the enemy attacks you in the morning or at night or someplace or somewhere, and it's a common fall that you always fight with, it's time to get on a prevent, preemptive strike mode. Meaning, when I, if it's at night time, I'm going to bed with my scriptures in my briefcase. I'm just using him. I'm going to pull out those papers, and before I go to bed, I'm going to charge that atmosphere in my room with the word before he even has a chance to tempt me in any way, shape, or form. That's doing the preventive. Otherwise, I sit there and hope that he doesn't show up, and then I end up having a bad night. So you, you can't, and this is the thing, and I've said this a million times, never say, will the Amalekites come over the hill? Because what you're doing is you're hoping that they don't, meaning you're waiting if they do. We can't be waiting for the devil to attack. We've got to be doing the constant attacking. We've got to be going at him with the word, with him with God's purposes and plans, not waiting for him to attack me. How many times have you heard the, your friends and family, Christians, say, I'm under attack? That's pretty common. So you go, oh, are you? It doesn't shock you because you hear it all the time. I'm under attack. How about you saying, I got him under attack? When have you heard a Christian say, hey, <laughs> I've got the devil on the run? No. You never hear Christians say, I've got the devil on the run. What you hear them say is, I'm under attack. Pray for me. That's when, you, that's, that's when we come together. Pray. Because the devil's already worked something in somebody's life or yours. That's why you want to pray. How about coming to me and saying, hey, I got the devil on the run. I really want to pray that I keep him on the run. Nope, you come to me and tell me what he's already done. Not what you're doing to him. And this is why the church is in the shape that it's in. That word lays dormant in the Bible, collects dust throughout the week. We don't even crack it open here because we got you now doing this. So you probably don't even pick it up anymore. But that word has to be nigh you in your heart and... How's it get in your heart? You meditate on it. And once you get it in your heart and you meditate on it and faith comes by hearing, then you speak that in faith. And we're, and we're not doing that. We're not doing that. So, what I want to do, what I want to do, and if the worship, worship team can come, what I want to do is take Thursday nights and teach on this, how to do it. And then I'm going to put something in your hands each Thursday night and so you may want to buy you a notebook. I'm not buying you another one. Half of you didn't bring it anymore, and you probably lost it, so I ain't, I ain't blowing money on notebooks. So you get your own little notebook and get a three-hole puncher or whatever you want to do or a folder and throw them in there. I'm going to be showing up with some uh, papers on Thursday night that um, will be not just scriptures, but like, say, scriptures to handle temptation, scriptures to handle anger, scriptures to handle lust. Scriptures to handle when your finances are low. Every, I'll th what we'll think of every assault the enemy can throw and then have you know how to charge your atmosphere. Or if you're depressed, you wake up and there's a dark cloud over your head. Well, what are you going to do? Just live with that cloud most of us do. We take a Xanax or something. We take a pill. No, there's scriptures to change the atmosphere that you can speak and change the, and drive the, resist the devil and what happens? He flees from you. But what are you going to resist him with? The Word. So we're going to take Thursdays to train you how to use your sword and give you something. And hopefully when it's done, well, you'll have a nice little notebook and then you'll memorize a lot of these scriptures by doing it. And then you just be able to flow in this. And you'll know exactly how to be a part of the Joshua generation. This is a characteristic of the Joshua generation. How do I know? The first thing he says besides arise was that this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate on it day and night. And then in Isaiah it says, this is the covenant that I will make with the, with the church, with Israel, the, the, new church, the New Testament church. Is I put my, my word where? In their mouth. And I'll put my word in their children's mouth. And I'll put my word in their children's children's mouth. That means the family. It's up to the family to speak words to one another out of the out of God's out of heaven or out of the Bible. So this is not something that we're going to try. This is a lifestyle. 
And if we're not doing this, it has to be part of our lifestyle. It's like a diet. It's not something you're going to do for 30 days to lose two pounds. What do they say? All diets got to be what? Lifestyle. So this is not something I'm going to have you try for a week and see if it works. It will work. It does work because the Bible says so. But it can't be tried for 30 days and then you got to fix and then you're done. Oh, yeah, you, you, have to, you put the devil on the run, but you think he's not going to come back? You're going to have to keep doing this. This is your sword. This is your offensive weapon. Amen? So let's stand. I'm going to worship the Lord a little bit. I don't know what God wants to do. Let's just let the Spirit move for a few minutes on you. You need prayer. You want somebody to pray for you. We'll, we'll, we'll lay hands on you. We'll pray. We'll impart. We'll do whatever we got to do. Um, whatever the Spirit has us do. If you got a word, a testimony or something, you might want to come up here and say, Hey, I, I got a word here. Or This ha this is a time for you to get involved and let us know what God's saying to you because I don't have all the message. I don't, I don't have every angle on this thing. And we need to hear from you anyway because it will be encouraging to hear what God's doing in your life. Just a few little two-minute testimony or whatever of what God's done this week or, or what God's speaking. you got a word. you got a, a scripture that, hey, this is a good scripture. Can I share it? That's what we're doing here. This is how everybody gets to participate and we get to minister one to another. So anything. And if you don't want to stay hanging around and just quietly leave, that's fine too. That's, we're just giving you and the Holy Spirit room to move.